going to be an update of the guidance that we gave in August, so we will not go through everything in exhaustive detail. We're just going to highlight the areas that have changed. Um, we are, my name is Andy Cleek, and I'm the co-director of the Managed Care Technical Assistance Center. Uh, and we are joined today by um, our colleagues at both OASF and OMH to, to answer questions. So, so on the MIGTEC side, we'll go through the billing guidance, and then our colleagues from OMH and OASF will jump in as needed to answer questions. So please, a couple things before we get started. Um, just want to highlight for folks that we will be, you know, going through a couple selected portions of the uh, billing guidance that have changed. Please, over the course of the webinar, chat in your questions, and we will answer as many questions as possible at the end. Uh, but please put them in the chat box. Do not put them in the uh, Q&A box. We're only going to look at the chat box, so just put them in the chat box. We'll coordinate all those questions and answer as many of them as we can at the end. And any additional questions we're not able to get to, um, we'll take back and also take those back to the state and, and try to get guidance for those as well. So um, this webinar will be posted online as well as the slides from the webinar online. Um, so please, there's no reason to take exhaustive notes of what's on the slides. Um, it'll all be posted online probably by the end of the day today, at least the slides from today. Um, so that'll all be online and that'll serve as, as the guidance and it will replace the guidance that was posted in August. Um, so I just, uh, I'm Andy Cleek, uh, Boris Gorin from MCTAC is going to go through the details today. Melissa Janidlo and Ileana Meltzer have worked with us in the background are on as well today to answer questions. And we just want to give a special thanks to Meg Beyer um, for really helping us pull this presentation together over a period of months without her hard work um, and organizational skill, um, this would not have been possible. So. Um, so MCTAC is, is really working with all the providers around New York State, both uh, mental health and substance use, to help them make the transition to managed care. Um, and I'm going to skip through some of our usual um, things today uh, and turn this over to Boris Lagorn. Great. Thank you, Andy, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, again, as uh, Andy mentioned, um, today we will focus on the updated portions of this presentation and, um, and also focus on some of the questions that have come up um, through the transition um, and billing uh, to managed care. So hopefully we'll be able to answer um, a lot of your questions um, that has been coming up through different means, uh, both to the state and MCTAC. Um, so again, just as a quick reminder, the purpose and the goal is to uh, support behavior health transition to managed care. This is for all uh, billing. This, um, for behavioral health, um, and we will walk through the again the updated components. Um, and there is this is going to be an ongoing work, as you can see. There is already an update to this, so I would not be surprised if there is slight tweaks that might happen again um, to this. And if there are, we will do another uh, quick um, you know presentation and update to this. Um, there is an integrated billing work group that includes representatives from OMH and OASIS, MCTAC, the coalition, COMPA, and others that have been working together and continue to work together uh, to address systemic billing issues. Um, and just to remind, providers are encouraged and should work directly with plans on specific provider claims issues. So again, the goal for uh, today is really to address um, a system-wide uh, billing issues and uh, guidelines, um, but on the individual provider basis should continue to work with um, the health plans on resolving any particular issues they might have. And as always, providers can submit their questions related um, to this, uh, to the OMH email box, uh, which is on, on the slide, and the OASIS box with any issues and questions they might have, and of course also to MCTAC. Um, as a reminder, uh, there is a managed care billing manual. It was updated um, in um, September, and we strongly encourage and would uh, even throughout this presentation we'll make references to it. The providers become familiar with this manual if you haven't done so already. There's a lot of good information in there and a lot of uh, guidance um, on the billing side of it. Okay, so I think we're going to skip this. This is just, uh, again, um, 
an introductory page that we covered before. Um, I think that this next one is um, important to just remind folks that managed care companies are, are required to contract um, with providers, five or more enrollees um, that they have. So providers are encouraged to contract with the managed care companies. Uh, again, just because the managed care companies are required to contract with providers um, doesn't mean the providers are, but we will you know, strongly encourage the providers to um, make sure that they have as many contracts as possible um, and as appropriate, of course, for them. Um, the plans are uh, also required to make a payment um, uh, for the government rates for the first 24 months. So for New York City, and this is focusing on New York City presentation, uh, that would be from October 1st, the 24 months begins from that point. Um, and of course, the plans must utilize a 3M grouper um, to ensure proper payment. Um, and uh, where appropriate, the APG services uh, should follow the, the same claim constructions as the fee-for-service and the three codes, HICPIC code, CPT, and so forth, the modifiers, which we will cover uh, again uh, during the presentation. Um, electronic claims, uh, all uh, plans are accepting and uh, electronic claims um, at this point from the OMH licensed clinics and OASA certified clinics and OTP programs uh, must submit claims on 837I um, and the APG codes and so forth. As such, for those OMH and OASA outpatient programs currently utilizing 837I, the primary billing rate in this activity will be uh, learning what process each plan utilizes for submitting the electronic claims. Again, this is just uh, encouraging and emphasizing that electronic claims, when possible, uh, should be utilized by providers. And the modifiers, we will be um, um, uh, constantly emphasizing that providers use appropriate modifiers uh, when billing uh, for their services. And those modifiers, again, could be um, both found um, in the billing manual, and there is a taxonomy um, rate sheet as well that provides all the modifiers and uh, needed codes. We have covered this before. There's no um, you know, change to the overview. Um, uh, there has been a question on credentialing. Uh, specific to agency level, so uh, as long as an agency or program is uh, licensed or certified by OMH and or OASIS, um, the contractor shall accept, meaning the health plan should accept that license and or certificate um, in place of um, other types of credentials, uh, but that uh, is only for the individual level credentialing the agency and programs still should go through the credentialing process, uh, meaning you know, filling out the application that's required by the health plan on the credentialing level, providing the certificates and licensure um, and other types of accreditation to managed care company um, as part of the contracting process um, that is um, still a requirement. And uh, the questions that uh, came up a lot um, during the last couple of months is what are the requirements on payment or prompt payment uh, law. And for um, the claims that are clean claims that are on paper, the plans have to pay within 45 days and 30 days uh, if they're submitted electronically. Yet another reason why claims uh, should be submitted uh, electronically when possible. Okay. So let's go, now we're going to start with uh, the actual field by field, but we're going to be skipping uh, a lot of fields here since there has been no change. Um, and this is again just an updated version. Um, so field one, this was just the basic provider information um, as well as field two, um, there has been no change to this. Uh, field three, uh, again, uh, no change to field three. Um, at, at this time. Field four, uh, we do want to spend a little bit of time on field four um, and discuss the uh, type of bill. We've gotten uh, both the state and MIGSAC got quite a few questions on it. So we have an updated um, 
um, additional slides here actually to go into more detail on the type of bill. As you can see, um, this particular field is a four digit alpha um, number code. Uh, the first digit is always zero for everybody. It's a lead, what's called a leading zero. It is a required field. Um, the second digit identifies the type of facility. The third identifies type of care. And the fourth uh, identifies, you know, the sequence of this bill. So we're going to jump into more details of each of those digits. Um, again, repeating that the first is a leading zero. The second digit, um, these are the choices that you have for the second digit that identifies the type of facility. Um, since we're focusing on New York City and outpatient ambulatory services only, um, for most part, uh, providers in this category should be utilizing uh, code seven uh, for the second digit that says clinic or hospital-based renal dialysis facility. Um, it's for both um, of those types of facilities, um, and that's the predominant and most common code for ambulatory outpatient services. Of course, for other types of facilities, you would use the appropriate code. Um, when using code 7, that changes uh, the choice for the third digit, which we have on the following page. Um, uh, if you look towards the bottom of this slide, the third digit should be uh, chosen uh, from uh, the second uh, portion of this, the bottom portion of the slide, which is um, highlighted with clinics only. When seven is used as a second digit, um, this is the selection for the third. And again, um, here, when we talk about uh, ambulatory outpatient services, um, you have two choices, really. You can either choose five or six um, as the third digit. For most part, I think providers will be using six. Um, I know it says community mental health center, but that's the most common. And of course, for the rehab uh, portions uh, or the rehab services, you can use five as your choice. Um, so again, um, walking through this and reminding folks, so the way it would stand right now, you would have zero, seven, and either five or six. Um, I know historically some folks might have used the code three from the top portion of this slide, um, you know, in, in some instances of this, and, and I, we've heard from folks that uh, have gone uh, denial on that. And so we just wanted to highlight. I also want to remind folks to please chat your questions um, as we go through this presentation, and we'll be answering them uh, as many as we can towards the end. Um, so again, so this will be the third digit. And as we move to the fourth digit um, of this um, field, it's important to underscore that for most part, providers will be using one in their fourth digit. That's kind of the new uh, claim, indicating that this is a new claim. In instances where you have to a, replace a claim, meaning you are rebilling, um, you should be using six. And of course, if you're void, voiding or canceling entirely the bill, you should be using seven. What we've heard from plans is that sometimes providers who rebuild um, because they're updating their claim sometimes uh, continue to use one. That will actually generate a denial uh, saying that this is a duplicate bill if you continue using one. Again, code one should be used only when it's a brand new first time in. Anything afterwards for the same date of service and, and, the, and the service itself um, should really be six or seven. Um, so in this particular instance, just to go through how this field would look, you would have zero, seven, six, and probably one would be the most common uh, code set for field four. Um, so we wanted to underscore this. All right, let's move on. Uh, field five, no change to it. Uh, six, again, no change. There's a reference here to the billing manual. Uh, this is the covers period from and through 
uh, we just wanted to highlight that uh, this field is required. And uh, so please pay attention to it. And for further information for OASIS OTP programs, uh, please refer to the billing manual. Uh, field seven, no change, as well as with eight, nine, I'm trying not to go too fast to get anybody dizzy, especially on the Monday morning. Field 10, no change. Field 11, stays the same. 12, not required, as well as 13. Um, 14, not required. 15, not required. 16, um, patient discharge status. There's a slight uh, update to field 17. It is not required. Um, for everybody except for WellCare and Fidelis. Um, and the common codes to be used here, again, this is, as you can see, the note on the bottom. This is for outpatient ambulatory services only. Um, the common codes would be 01 uh, if, it's, if the individual was discharged to home or self-care. Um, that would be referred to as routine discharge. Or 30 would be the code if the individual is still uh, receiving treatment, ongoing treatment with your facility. Again, these common codes um, and uh, requirements or not required depending on the plan is only applicable to outpatient ambulatory services. It would be different for inpatient. Field 18 through 28, condition code not required. This is also um, a change. Um, for well care, there is a note just to uh, keep in mind that within um, outpatient claims that are within 72 hours of inpatient claim um, do require condition code, um, and that is commonly would be used as 51. But this is a change, and um, otherwise it's not required for all the plans. Uh, Bill 29, no change, as well as 30. 31 through 34 are occurrence codes. They are no longer required by any plans. I think originally there might have been some plans requiring this, as well as 35 and 36. 37, no change. 38, no change. Another uh, point just to remind folks, this is not only for uh, New York City um, ambulatory outpatient. We're only focusing on Medicaid. Um, population here, so some of the the next set of codes or fields, I should say, are not required um, because it's not for we're not um, this is not for commercial or Medicare or any other type of payer. Um, value code, um, there is uh, no change. It's still 24 is the code that must be followed immediately by four-digit rate code. Um, and it's important to remember that um, the, the claim should be submitted with one rate code per day, per week, or per month, um, and it's uh, required. And to note that for Empire Blue Cross Blue Shield Health Plus, uh, previously known as Amerigroup Health Plus, um, there must be a zero zero that follows um, the rate code. Uh, but again, there's no change uh, to this field. Uh, value codes, um, the next fields are not required. There's no change to this. Revenue codes. Um, so now we'll touch base on revenue codes um, and talk about uh, them for a moment. I have another uh, slide here that will be shared. So revenue codes has been another area where of confusion. Um, and discussion. So working together with the state and the plans, um, we are uh, hoping to finalize this and wanted to share um, this information with you. Um, so over the years, providers have used many different um, uh, codes when billing fee-for-service and managed care. What our goal is, and um, everybody's in agreement, to try to come to a common standard minimum required code set. And when we say minimum required, this is really minimum required by the plans to accept. Uh, the plans can choose 
to accept other revenue codes in addition to this. Uh, there is nothing wrong with that. If they have accepted and paid uh, providers for other revenue codes, there's no need to reprocess or rebuild anything. Um, you can continue using those revenue codes. The goal here is, again, to kind of come um, to an agreement to a minimum set of uh, revenue codes. And what you will see here, which we will not go into detail, is per each program and service, um, the minimum required codes. As you can see, there's a lot of um, similarities across all services. And we will make uh, this available um, as well. Um, but I, again, I just want to underscore there is no need to rebuild if a plan has already accepted codes um, and are allowing other codes than these. Uh, for this, we will also work closely with the plans to try to establish a more comprehensive list for each plan um, so folks have that. Uh, but we wanted to share at least the minimum required set. It is definitely a required field um, and should be submitted. A um, couple of things. If providers are using revenue codes that's outside of um, the plan's um, kind of ability to accept, uh, providers will have to rebuild those working together directly with the plan. Um, my understanding is the plans cannot automatically reprocess those. So some of you might have experience, but in our experiences, when the providers have rebuilt using appropriate revenue codes, they have gotten paid. And I also want to underscore that uh, the set of revenue codes that um, we're working on, again, um, on the screen, plans need time to update their system. Some of these codes they already accept, some are new. Um, so please um, be patient with them and give them time to be able to update their system. Hopefully by the end of January, the latest is not much sooner, um, they'll be able to accept these uh, minimum uh, code sets, um, but they're all in the process of working and trying to update their system with the holiday schedule um, and everything else. Um, just wanted to make sure folks understood that. Okay. Revenue description, there's no change, it's not required. Um, the modifiers and CPT codes, uh, there's no change to this field as well. Service dates, of course, are required. Uh, service units, again, please refer to the taxonomy uh, chart. This is the link, you should be very familiar with it. It gives you a lot of information and uh, required units depending on the services you're billing for. Um, there has been no change to that. Um, same thing with fields 47 or 48. Uh, 49 stays the same, as well as 50. So, so these are all not required uh, as before. Okay, 56 still it's an NPI. It's still required. No change to this as well as 57 or 58. Um, as we move through these, uh, there's no changes to this. Uh, again, these are the same as before with field 60, as well as 61, 62, um, 63. Um, there's no change, but I think it's important to just stop here for a moment and talk about authorization, especially for those services that require authorization. And as we move uh, towards January 1st, for programs who will need to obtain authorization, um, we strongly recommend you refer to the utilization management uh, presentations that have been done by NICTAC and the charts that have been posted both during those presentations and by the state outlining which services and when require authorization in the 90-day um, period that is coming to an end. So it's important, one, that uh, providers work with the plans um, to obtain authorization. It is not required um, to, be, to be on the claim, the actual authorization number, 
but I think it's very important for providers to realize that it is required, again, for those services to make sure that the plan has it in their system. Um, otherwise, the claim will not get paid. Um, uh, also, to strongly, um, you know, suggest that when you do get denials as a provider that states authorization not obtained and you are uh, sure that there was authorization, it's important to also check what was authorized versus what you are billing for. Um, because if you're billing for something different that was authorized, it is the same denial code uh, because that particular service and or program was not authorized. Um, so that's another area to check on um, before um, you know you, you you know might be concerned about this particular field. But again, it's not required that you actually put the code. Um, in my experience. I think it's a good way internally to track this, um, but it should not uh, hold back your claims. Field 64, uh, no change, it's not required, as well as 65, 66, 67. Um, please make sure that you're using the ICD-10 codes right now. Um, again, there is no change. Um, for this, field 68, not required. Admitting diagnosis code, that's a change. Um, initially, there were a few plans that required it, so it's not no longer required for ambulatory outpatient services. So it, this is a change. Patient reason for visit, it's not required except for well care. 71, not required, as well as 72, 73, and 74, not required, as well as 75. 76, uh, we want to, um, again, spend a little time on this. There's no change. There was guidance given by uh, both the OMH and OASIS in regards to attending provider MPI. Um, we want, want to make sure we highlight that. Um, this is just literally a copy and paste from that guideline. Uh, please refer to that guideline for especially the electronic submission of your claims um, and making sure that both your system and if you're using the clearinghouse, that the clearinghouse can accept this. Um, but this is uh, the same guideline that has been given out um, not so long ago, 77 and 78, again, um, um, same as before, but just highlighting there's still some confusion and some concern about these uh, fields, so please make sure you reference both this presentation and the guidelines that has been uh, provided by the state. 79, there's no change, as well as 80. Um, 81. Um, and so with 81, that completes all the fields. Um, we did want to quickly go through with, uh, common errors. Again, I think a lot of them uh, we touched base in the initial presentation. Um, we do want to highlight that we also heard that providers um, are sometimes putting in incorrect rate codes when billing. Please make sure you're using the appropriate rate codes for services. Uh, we talked about authorization. Um, the charges that you put on the claim needs to be at a minimum the Medicaid rate. Um, otherwise, if you put it less than Medicaid rate, that's what you will get reimbursed. So when you get uh, payments that are less than Medicaid, I would still check first what you built. Um, if you were billing Medicaid rates or above and getting paid less, then you definitely should contact the plan and have the discussion with them because they should be paying you the Medicaid rate. If you have by accident or other means put in a wrong rate that's below Medicaid, um, you should be resubmitting your claim but working directly with the plan um, and working through that process. Um, and of course, on field four, you would put the appropriate code indicating that you're resubmitting the claims. Um, the modifiers, uh, please 
please, please use the modifiers, the appropriate modifiers, uh, to make sure the one um, that also drives the appropriate payments um, and also uh, reduces the denials, because some rate codes and or HICPIC codes are same between OASIS and OMH, and in some instances it might be only the modifier that distinguishes the service. Um, it's also important, coming back to the credentialing, that the managed care company is aware of all of your sites and programs uh, through the credentialing process, um, and it's a part of their system. Um, eligibility, of course, tracking the member eligibility. The diagnosis is in the ICD-10. Um, you know, there's a timely filing uh, issues that slowly were coming through that time. And, uh, of course, incorrect client information or wrong procedure codes um, come up um, as a potential ongoing errors to keep in mind. And as be before, when things go wrong, as we said, please contact your plan. If you need to email OMH and Oasis, please do so. Um, you can always email MCTAC as well. Um, you can also uh, reference the matrix for more information. We are constantly updating it, putting new information into Matrix. Um, so we strongly recommend um, that you refer to it if you need to know who to contact in the managed care company if you don't have an assigned individual. And of course, the links to the manuals, uh, the ACBS manual, uh, the billing manual we talked about, the fee schedule and rate codes, um, and so forth, and this is our information um, in regards to questions. Um, as mentioned before, this presentation will be posted uh, hopefully today, and we're also recording it, um, so the entire presentation will be recorded. Um, so with that, we wanted to um, open for questions. All right. Uh, Okay, there we go. All right, let's uh, try to get through the questions. Somebody um, was waving my glasses, implying that I might need glasses to read this, but I think I can, I'm going to try without the glasses. Uh, has any recent guidance come out regarding billing for buy and bill? So this is a pharmacy uh, question. Um, no, but we are working with the state um, on coming up with a presentation for pharmacy, um, especially injectables and so forth. Um, in the meantime, um, I would recommend um, referencing a, on DOH. There is uh, a lot of information by managed care company um, in regards to some of their um, one formularies currently um, and other types of information and contact information. Uh, so I would strongly recommend providers reference that uh, side, but we are working with the plans and the state to come up with a presentation um, for uh, the buy and bill. Um, I just want to see if uh, Ileana and or Melissa, and I also noticed that Gwen joined. Uh, so Morgan, can you um, unmute everybody and um, all of the panelists so this way folks can jump in if they would like to? Thank you, Morgan. So any additional information from our state partners? Okay. Um, so the next question is, if a first provider has a license uh, professional of healing arts, has not yet completed OPER enrollment, it's in the process, may they bill the MCO? Um, I am not sure, actually. Uh, Melissa or Gwen, would you know the answer? Is about OPER enrollment? Yes, they should be able to bill managed care and fee-for-service as well. Great, great. Thank you. Um, Thank they, you. they can use the supervisor or the agency NPI in its place um, because only a referring provider is required for pros. Okay. Okay. Okay? Thank you. 
Yep, thank, thank you. you. Yep, thank you. So the next uh, question there was, please clarify the type of bill uh, for ACT. So I'm going to try to uh, jump to that. So for ACT, um, again, it should be seven for the second digit for the type of bill, um, followed by, I don't think it should change since seven is chosen for the second digit. Um, you would probably use six um, for the Community Mental Health Center um, at this point, and then, of course, one uh, for the new bills. Um, it would be similar or the same as for everybody else um, in this category. Unfortunately, these are um, federal, um, you know, kind of codes, and there is a limit to what these codes mean, and so we need to use the best codes we can um, to match for the programs. And I know sometimes it might not be exactly the same, um, but that would be the, the code set that would be recommended. We are an Article 31 clinic, but see clients at home. What should we put in field four when we see them at home? It, uh, field four is not a place of service. It's a type of bill, um, so you would continue to do that. Um, I would also um, make sure that it's appropriate. I know there are some home visits that are allowed for Article 31, but some are not, um, unless you have a special arrangement maybe with managed care. So you should really uh, work with um, them uh, directly uh, on the managed care side. Uh, it seems there's a mistake for the fourth digit. Eight is for void. Seven is for replacement. All right, we'll look at that. Thank you for um, that comment. Uh, for FQHC, it's use code three for the second billing digit. Uh, for FQHC, um, yes, if it's appropriate, and um, let's uh, just take a look quickly. That is correct. Three would be for FQHC. We get a lot of questions on field four as we've been getting them. Um, so for third digit, would only OMH license facilities select community mental health center um, in number six? Um, so again, this is a, a code set that's available or um, on the federal level, so if there, you know, um, uh, the answer is this will go beyond just the OMH licensed facilities. Uh, if you're a rehab facility, um, you know, like an IPRT and pros, you can uh, should be able to use five, and probably within Oasis, um, some of the programs uh, could use five in the third digit, um, but either one of those. Uh, could be used both by uh, OASIS and OMH certified slash licensed uh, facilities. Okay, let me just go through some of the other codes. Okay, just to remind, this is for behavioral health ambulatory services. This is not for health home. Uh, we have a couple of questions around the health home billing, so please make sure that you work directly um, with the health home lead and your billing folks that this presentation does not apply to health homes. Are there revenue codes for pros? The pros finance guide says use 024 for fee for service. Uh, yes, we're going to, again, the, the presentation we're going to have um, minimum requirement for uh, revenue codes. It will include pros. When we publish that, um, it would be there. Um, but again, just as a reminder, if plans are accepting other revenue codes in addition to those minimum sets, please continue using that. Um, but uh, we're working on establishing a minimum set for pros as well. Do you have a list of which plans and are not able to accept various revenue codes? Um, no, because what we want to do is actually, again, set up a standard revenue code set uh, that all plans will accept. As I've mentioned in the presentation, um, I please would ask everybody to be patient for folks, for the plans to be able to make sure their system is able to 
um, accept all of those revenue codes. A lot of plans already accept a lot of those revenue codes, and plus most have accepted even revenue codes in addition to those. Um, but the goal is to really have a minimum uh, standard set for all. And as we work with the plans, we will publish all revenue codes that each plan has. Um, at least that's our goal. Uh, what services will require authorization effective 1116? Please refer to the utilization management presentation and um, the guidance that the state has posted. There's a grid um, that kind of talks about which uh, services require authorizations and when. Um, There's more questions on pharmacy. Again, just to remind folks, we will be doing that uh, hopefully in January. Okay, do OASIS facilities have to use CPT codes like 90832 for licensed professionals, LMSW and HICPIC codes, GO396 for unlicensed professionals? Um, Ileana, would you be able to um, answer that? Hi, answer yep. that? Hi everybody. Um, the use of the CPT or the Hicks PICS codes when billing the managed care companies is consistent with the claiming and coding that you would have done underneath the ambulatory patient groups. So you would use the code that's specific and appropriate for the type of service that's being provided and the rendering practitioner. The field will recall that we've allowed um, the use of CPT and Hicks PICS codes for the majority of our services for those circumstances where someone like a CASAC may be providing the service and would need to use the HICPIX code. So from the program's perspective, if it's someone who is rendering the service and it's underneath their scope of practice, they can utilize the CPT code. That's certainly appropriate. And they may also choose to use the HICPIX code. And I would recommend they take a look at the um, APG manual just for a refresher on um, some of the background on that. Great, thank you. Uh, there's a question, do all managed care plans have to cover methadone services? Yes, that falls under the OTP, um, and they should be contracting with folks um, on that. For those services. For those services. Hi, may I just add something else? This is Ileana from the office. Please, please. Yeah. <laughs> I just went back about 20 years and said where I was from a long time ago. This is Ileana from OASA. Sorry. Um, the plans are required. To, uh, Opioid treatment programs, OASAS certified opioid treatment programs are designated as essential behavioral health providers. So the plans must offer a contract to all the OTP programs. And then within the context of that contract, the services that are delivered by that OASAS certified program are included in the benefit package. Great, thank you. So we have quite a few on the field um, four. Um, so I think um, let, let's quickly review again field four because we're getting uh, a lot of questions on that. Um, so just going through this, the first digit is zero. We haven't got any questions on the first digit, so I'm happy about that. Um, the second digit um, for facility type, again, we're focusing on uh, ambulatory service for most um, ambulatory, if not all, should be seven, right? That would be the most common uh, code used. But again, if you're a different type of a, a facility, you should use appropriate code for most uh, folks on the phone today um, for ambulatory service, it would be seven. When using seven uh, per uh, federal guidelines, um, there are three third digit sets of codes. One of those is specific for seven. When using seven, you are then bound by these nine codes, which is on the bottom part of this presentation. Um, again, you know, for FQACs, of course, you would use number three. You need to use the appropriate codes that are specific to your uh, facility, uh, because as you credential, with the health plans, you indicate the type of program and or facility um, that you are. So those things need to match when the bills come in. If you're not an FQHC, 
you would either use five or six, depending on the program and depending on the services, um, you know, for this particular um, area. Again, it's important to um, use the right code set as it especially matches to your credentialing and as you work with each health plan. The fourth digit, then um, it's either for ambulatory services, one, when it's a new claim, and for ambulatory services, um, it's really just one claim at a time um, that you submit, or six or seven. So those are the, the kind of the, the breakdown of field four on a common basis. You should always work um, and follow the health plan uh, you know, instructions as well and work with them uh, together. We did run this by, by all health plans. Um, it seems like uh, to our knowledge and feedback that uh, this is the, you know, process that they would be following. Um, but again, in, in case there's any issues that you're particularly experiencing, you should touch base with them. Some of it might be due to the credentialing or program or how things are identified either in their system or how you identified yourself during the facility program credentialing and how the bills go in, um, and also what might be happening during the billing process. These are the common sets. They're not, they should not be used all across the board. If for your facility and or bill it's different, you should refer to the appropriate uh, codes um, to build a managed care company, and if there's any problems, discuss with them. Um, so again, you know, that is the, the code sets um, that are, are common use and, and for all facilities um, that are ambulatory um, at this time. So hopefully that uh, uh, clarified it a little further. I know there was, again, a lot of questions on it um, for it. So just uh, let me just kind of go through again if there's any additional questions. Um, Okay, we are an OMH and OASIS clinic. Uh, in reference to field 42 revenue codes, would we be in wrong if we just use 914 for both services, or should we be using 513 for OASIS and 914 for OMH? Um, per the minimum standard, you should be able to use both, uh, 914 probably for both. As um, uh, Let me actually just double check. Because um, again, we're trying to um, and the plants and everybody else um, would like to make it as straightforward and standardized as possible. Um, uh, you know, per uh, what we're working with plants, you know, there's four codes, for example, on the screen right now for clinics that's both mental health and substance use. Um, you know, either one of those could be used. Um, but I think it's important to also uh, highlight their accuracy in coding is very important in addition to what the standards might be or guidelines. Um, so if you feel it's more appropriate to use 513 for one and 914 for another, I think that would be you know, important to review internally with your uh, both you know, compliance and other folks um, in regards, but from pure technical perspective, either one of these should be accepted. Um, but again, it's uh, strongly recommended that you internally review your own coding um, and compliance processes. Okay, let's uh, see what other questions we have here. Um, okay, just to underscore, uh, not only this presentation does not apply to health homes, this also, we got some FIDA questions. This does not apply to FIDA. This is for Medicaid. Uh, transition to managed care only. Um, so please work with your FIDA plans directly in regards to any billing questions you might have. Um, and there might be some differences in how um, they process them. Okay. Uh, just uh, going through some of these. I think this um, should cover um, most, if not all, questions. Um, 
for for now. Um, I just want to open uh, the phone both for uh, for Ileana, Gwen, and Melissa who have joined, and see if uh, um, you want to add anything before we wrap up. I would say that if you have any um, issues, questions, problems, or concerns, please contact us. Um, our um, mailboxes are both on this presentation, and please follow the taxonomy chart and the billing guidelines. Um, and we're here to help. So if you have any problems, issues, concerns, questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. Don't wait. Um, and have your claims go over date. Hi, and thanks, Melissa. And this is Ileana Meltzer from OASS. Yeah, I just want to reiterate um, just a couple things. Um, we do really appreciate when the programs bring issues to our attention. It allows us to facilitate claiming between them and the plans. Um, and so to the extent that if programs continue to encounter specific issues, certainly please reach out to the plan representatives to keep the plans in the loop, but also continue to reach out to the OASS pick a mailbox. Um, and then just as a thank you generally to the field, to MC TAC, to all the different folks out there that have been working so diligently over the last few months to try and work through and resolve through the issues. We just really appreciate everyone's effort, um, patience, uh, persistence as we continue to work through some of the um, outstanding issues. So hopefully everyone found this presentation helpful and thank you very much. Great, and, and I wanna just say thank you to our state partners for participating and the health plans um, they have been uh, involved, um, you know, all together and, and working on uh, making this as, as smooth as possible and uh, um, as standard um, across all the plans. Um, again, I want to underscore what uh, Melissa and Ileana and I have said. Please, um, you know, if you're having problems, um, especially if you're having problems with your own billing systems, in our clearing houses and are not able to bill uh, for whatever the reasons. One, you should be working directly with the health plans, letting them know, um, but also you should be letting the state know, um, especially if you suspect that this might be an extensive issue. Um, we, we are, you know, hitting, our, as I mentioned before, 90 days um, and so forth. There's a timing uh, filing issue that might happen. And unless individuals, plans, and state and others are aware that you're having technical difficulties, um, you know, we can help you, they can help you, or work with you on um, how to maybe resolve some of the timing filing issues. So can't um, emphasize enough of that. Um, so with that, uh, again, I want to say thank you to everybody. Um, and I know this is a, a week right before the holiday um, season really kicks off, and so I want to wish everybody happy holidays, and um, and I guess we'll talk next year, hopefully. All right, take care, everybody, and thank you for joining.